This is the golden era of the Four Seasons, Part 5. We're here with Bob Gaudio, Joe Long, Dimitri Callas, and Frankie Valli, hearing their words, their story, and their music. The year is 1967, and Frankie Valli has had a monster hit called Can't Take My Eyes Off of You. The next group single was out in June 1967, and a record called Come On, Mary Ann written by Larry Brown and Ray Bloodworth, noteworthy for two reasons. They were singers of their own, calling themselves the Distant Cousins, and they write heavy material. I loved that song. I I always did. And it really wasn't what, especially the way they played it for us, because neither one of them are really musicians. And they kind of like plunked it, you know. But there was just something there that... Uh, it was a magic melody. It was just catchy, so catchy that you just had to do it. Had there been a decision to move into heavier material? We were into, uh, just before that, uh, I guess going back to, uh, to, to the Tell It to the Rain period, we were into playing more on our own dates, too. Mm-hmm. So I guess we were getting more of a flavor of our own sound prior to... Uh, in the early, earlier part of the group's career, we were using uh, studio musicians. You mentioned the fact that it was a heavier approach, and I think the reason was that uh, long about the time that we recorded Tell Us the Rain, we got more involved instrumentally in our own records. We began playing more on our own records. So we were able then to inject even more of our own personalities. Rather than just the vocal part of it, we were able to... Uh, to utilize whatever instrumental thing we had for our own music. So uh, the sound changed. Uh, for example, Begging, you mentioned Begging before, and, and Marianne, and, uh, and a few others that followed Marianne. Uh, we, we, we did get more of ourselves into those records because we're playing and singing. It was around this time that a British group called the Tremlows had a hit with one of your songs we mentioned earlier during 1964 from the Born to Wonder album called Silence is Golden. We were talking a few minutes ago about Brown and Bloodworth. Just how did you come about to record their material? Uh, Larry Brown, uh, and I think it's Raymond, um, had been signed to Bob Cruz's office as writers. Mm -hmm. So naturally, you know, uh, we were up there and we got to know them and so on and so forth, and they were writing things, and he came and let me hear that one particular song that just floored me. Right. And uh, in fact, they got a big just had a couple of big hits with Dawn. Right. Not uh, Ray Bloodworth, but Larry Brown is writing with, uh, I forgot, Levine. That summer, 1967, The Wonder Who had their fourth release and their second big hit with another folk-type song, Lonesome Road. There was, there was, there was um... No, yeah, well, that was really the only two. We did another session, Uh which had three three or four things on it. We had um, Good Ship Lollipop, I, I was on the same session. Oh, you're talking about sessions. I thought you were talking about releases. Yeah. There was one. There was one before that. Good Ship Lollipop was and the B side of of uh, Lonesome Road. Then there was another one after that. There was another one. Uh, was there? Yeah, it was on the it was on the new the new vault uh, the new gold uh, hits. Oh yeah, you're right. There was. What was it? Oh, what was it? It was another. No, we did. Uh, <laughs> we did the other three. As a matter of fact, we right. did a Good Ship Lollipop, Lonesome Road, and the one that I can't think of. There was another, uh, there was another one to who released, one, one other release. After the fall of 1967, and by this time it's somewhat apparent that music is changing again. Away from the groups to the solo singer. The kick em in the shins kind of rock is being replaced by ballads, particularly country. Why was the music changing? The ch- trends changed in everything, you know, in, in, in clothes styles and food uh, habits. It's just a, a trend, uh, a style of music is, is a trend, let's face it. And uh, every so often, the, the public uh, is going to just get tired of a certain sound. I, I think it's just a matter of trends. I don't see where, where somebody put their finger on a button and said, okay, from now on, no more group records. It's going to be all single artists or it's going to be all folk rock. It's just a trend. If, if a few people come up and break through with a hit in a certain style, I'm sure it's going to influence the, the, the music industry in general. 
That's right. Ray Charles was influencing people in country music uh, 10 years before Jeannie C. Riley was doing it. That's right. And the country went into a, the, the whole country went into a country and western bag because Ray Charles had two. He, I think he was the number one country and western singer in 1956. Figure that one out, you know. But uh, he did he did put the country into a country and western uh, uh, format, you know. Yeah. I think any big hit, any super hit, uh, will have its effects for the rest of the year on what comes out. You know, if it's a big, big country hit, then everybody gets into a little bit of a country bag for a while, you know. If a big R&B hit, everybody's into the R&B bag for a while. But country, well, country and R&B have always been around. You'll always see them popping up. Somebody will always have a big country hit, and somebody will always have a big R&B hit that will cross into the top 40 market. It's grassroots records, you know, I mean, those kind of songs are just here. The next Frankie Valley single is also a big hit. I Make a Fool of Myself in September 1967. Yeah, I remember not wanting to put that out. That's what I remember. <laughs> I think if it wasn't released at that time and released at some later date, it could have been another tremendous hit for Frankie. I just think it was m much too close yeah. to can take my eyes off you. And uh, to follow a record be that close to it doesn't thrill me frankie valley what were your feelings uh like i said earlier you know i i i try not to record anything i don't like i like i make a fool of myself song wise i think it uh it has great content and uh melodically and musically it's, it's Probably one of the best songs that Bob Crew and Bob Goyo ever wrote. Definitely. If ever they, they had a shining hour, I, I would have to say that uh, mm -hmm. this was something they had done in their shining Frankie's vocal versatility showed through in many songs included in a Phillips album, Frankie Valley Solo. It contained all of his previous single releases and some beautiful standards, such as Secret Love and the beautiful My Funny Valentine. In what may be described as an ill-fated late attempt at flower power, the fall release by the group was called Watch the Flowers Grow. I'd pass on that. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> that was... Uh, you were right. That was a belated attempt at the flower power. Wow. That's exactly that was Bob Cruz's um, brainchild. Wasn't that a brown and blood word? Yeah, it was, but I mean, it was, he insisted on doing it because he felt that it was a hit. It was a hit. It was, yeah, it was number went to number 15, as a matter of fact. It did sell a lot of records. I just didn't particularly like it, and I'm sure a lot of people did and didn't, but it did sell, so I guess it was successful. It wasn't a, a great of, image to yeah. follow, but a lot, a lot of know, people it was a hit felt, record. A lot of people felt that we were sort of selling out, you know, that we were giving in to the... Uh, to the thing, the flower power right. thing, yeah, and uh, I guess in a sense we were. <laughs> uh, luckily, though, we found ourselves and got off that thing rather quickly. Frankie Valley had another big hit in late 1967 with a song called "To Give." Uh, we're, we're really proud of that record. It's a great record. Yeah, I can't understand why it wasn't number one. <laughs> We've heard that song performed uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> by just about everybody. But who's the uh, Gomer Pyle? What's his name? Uh, Jim, Jim Neighbors. Yeah. That was one of the big songs in his act. And there, there's a guy that had it. There was a number one record in Italy, uh, the Italian version to get. It's a beautiful song. Great message. We used it in our concerts uh, for quite a while until relatively recently. It never failed to uh, bring the house down was quickly on the charts with a nostalgic remake of the 1960 Shirelles hit, Will You Love Me Tomorrow? I don't think we No, again, as I say, we never really did any, uh, well, a few, but you just mentioned one, unfortunately, that I try to forget, watch the flowers grow, but we never really try to go along with trends, you know, we just did something we liked, and that is one of my all-time favorite songs, you know. Uh, and we did it, you know, we tried it, we did a vocal thing on it and rearranged it and so on and so forth. By the way, it's a Carole King song, you know. I don't think any nice. of us were uh, were conscious of the fact of any so-called rock and roll revival at that time. We were 
you know, we weren't talking about the fact that, hey, all the old artists are coming back and uh, therefore the old songs are coming back. It's just a song that everybody really flipped on and, uh, and we wanted to do it, but in our own way. And nothing to do with uh, the uh, nostalgia. Tonight your life completely. Why do you think that there was such a wave of old rock music, particularly at this time? I think because rock and roll is now entering its second generation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the people who are now fathers and mothers uh, were teenagers when rock first hit. And uh, all adults uh, at one point revert back to their young days, their early, you know, their teenage days or whatever. So now there, there is, a, an, a, there is a, a, a generation of people who can say, hey, when I was a kid, the so-and-sos had a record out, mm -hmm. you know. There were, the first group of rock and roll fans couldn't do that because right. uh, before, before, you know, well, let me, let me start again. The 25-year-olds of 1950, uh, when they reverted back to their days when they were 15 and 16 year old, years old, there was no rock and roll music. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, will, from now on, there'll always be, as far as I'm concerned, a segment of the pop music, uh, of, of pop music that'll be uh, nostalgia. You know, because we go into more and more generations of rock and roll. The next release was another complete departure for the group, a song called Saturday's Father. That came out of an album called The Genuine Imitation Life Gazette, which to my mind is the best thing we've ever done. However, uh, it seems as though most people didn't believe that type of a message or whatever you want to call it now. Uh, it, it, it was too heavy for us, so we were told. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we did the album. Uh, Saturday's Father was sort of a feeler, I guess you might say, you know, to find out what the acceptance would be to uh, a concept album by the Four Seasons. Uh, and as we figured, the, the, the uh, reaction was mixed. Some people said, hey, what are, you know, what are they trying to do? You know, other people uh, showed an interest. So we thought that we had a shot. We released the album only to find out that uh, the traditional Four Seasons fans didn't like the area into which they thought we were heading, and the so-called underground kids, because you remember in that, at that period, it was like underground was just, you know, the word underground was being thrown about uh, like crazy. Well, they, on the other hand, said, well, uh, uh, no matter how good the album is, or no matter how bad it is, whatever, uh, we don't like it because it's by the Four Seasons. We even saw a review in the Berkeley Barb, which is one of the leading underground papers in the country, it said that possibly the best album of the year, but if Moby Grape had recorded it, it would be number one. <laughs> so, you know, where are we going with that kind of attitude, you know? Frankie, what were your feelings on the experimental album Genuine Imitation Life Gazette? Well, Genuine Imitation Life Gazette was, uh was a project that I really wasn't uh, too fond of for my own reasons. Uh, it's uh, not that... I just thought there was enough trouble in the world and so forth and so on uh, without reminding people how much, you know, how many problems there were. And I knew that our audience wouldn't accept us for it. And I knew that the... Uh, at that time, it was the underground audience. I knew they wouldn't accept us because they were a very strange audience. How about us? Mm -hmm. They only liked an artist until they made it, and then they, they didn't like him anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were so disloyal to so many of the artists. They liked it until they made it, and they, they stopped liking them, you know, which was totally unfair. Some of the people were really superstars. The album was almost a year in the making, and as Joe indicated, it was the first concept album by the group, and the reaction was at least mixed. Why do you think the public was not ready to accept a change in the Four Seasons? No, I don't think the public's uh, ready to accept any change in any group except for the Beatles. Yeah, right. You know, it's really that simple. They're, they have been, to my mind, the only group that's ever been allowed to grow up in public. This marked a distinct turning point in the career of the Four Seasons. The album, Genuine Imitation Life Gazette, was labeled by some as a big put-on. And as the guys indicated, it wasn't in character for the group, who had racked up an unequaled five-year string of hits. The single, Saturday's Father, was the first social conscious single by the group, again out of character with the group. 
Had the group forsaken the album project and continued as they had been, perhaps the remainder of the story would be different. Nobody knows. Thus we come to the end of the golden era of the Four Seasons.